Well, we're here in the Leopold Stadt rehearsal room, and I'm here with the playwright, um, Tom Stoppard. A few months ago, I I asked you what your best hours are. You said 12 till 4. That's noon, by the way. Yes, yes, noon till 4 p.m. I just start work about noon and and work till 4 or 5. Yes. Mm. We start rehearsals at 10.30 a.m. How are you you coping with that? You know, uh, honourably. I'm not sure that I've even been late once. I don't think I have. You you have been late, have but, I? but oh, forgivably. Dear. I mean, not not in an outrageous way. Oh, right. but it's the playwright's privilege well, it, to drift in and out. Different directors have different ideas of what a playwright's privileges consists of. I've known directors uh, over the years who essentially uh, have banished me for periods. And then there are others who kind of get a bit fidgety if you're not there all the time. And I don't really feel that I should be there all the time, but I simply like uh, the experience of rehearsal. Uh, It's always interesting. I'm always happy to sit in a rehearsal and observe and say nothing whatsoever. But there are times when I was younger where I would interrupt, stick an oar in, probably too often. I hope by now I've got more or less the right balance. Oh, you're impeccable. We worked together on Travesties a few years ago, and I remember at the time you were saying, I'm, I must write a new play, I'm desperate to write a new play, but I, oh. don't, I don't quite have one. And then at some point you went away and, and burrowed and found yourself in Vienna which seems to me a very natural place for you to be. You've been in Vienna before with three adapted plays, um, two schnitzlers and a Nestroy Nestroy in the 70s and 80s. What led you to Vienna this time? It was um, to some degree more personal. I'm Czech, not Austrian. I was born in a town you could drive to from Vienna, but it was in Czechoslovakia. Zlin. Zlin, it was called, yes, Zlin. It's been at the back of my mind that it's something I've never used. It felt like unfinished business. Those who don't know, what is it, where is it, and why is the play called it? Leopoldstadt is the old Jewish quarter of Vienna, from very early on. It was the Jewish quarter, and at different times uh, it became really overcrowded as bad things happened north and east where Russia and Galicia. There were lots of refugees finding their way to Vienna because around about um, the 1860s, the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire emancipated his Jews. If you were a Jew in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you had the same rights as everybody else. Leopoldstadt was still the part of town for the poor Jews. As the Jews got more successful a generation later, there were many baronial Jews. Mm -hmm. Some of them famous would know about the hair with amber eyes is about a family Mm -hmm. who were like Rothschild. And Schnitzler was uh, another, mm-hmm. you know, Viennese Jew. Mahler was born a Jew. So Jews and culture in Vienna, they were indissoluble, really. Mm-hmm. And Leopoldstadt simply means Leopold town. This feels to me very you that the play is called, called Leopoldstadt, but it's not set there. <laughs> it's set in the posh side of town. This play strikes me as both notable and inevitable in that it deals with elements of your Judaism yes. uh, and your ownership of that side of you, um, which you've addressed, I would say, indirectly over the years in your work. But in this... You, Latterly. In, in this, you, you address it directly. Knowing you as I do, I suspect that wasn't because it's relevant It's just what came. It's quite hard to sort of look at the way I navigated from from this vantage. In 1976 or 7, I wrote a piece which was entirely about Russian Jews being denied exit visas for Israel by the Russians. I prefer the Leopoldstadt kind of play Mm -hmm. because um, I like theatre more than I like meta-theatre. 
and there's a lot of meta theatre around, which, by which I mean plays which are self-aware about themselves as being plays, mm -hmm. commenting on themselves and so on. You started all that. No, I can't possibly claim <laughs> that, thank but you, you were, very much. You were a practitioner uh, yes, of that I, at, I, at one point I in did, your career. I did, I did. Yes, yes. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead is I. There was meta, a period where it was, what I've said was uh, upside down because I used to prefer meta theatre. Right. <coughs> I notice you have a slight cough, Tom. I notice also, uh, because I spend a lot of time with you, that you're a fervent smoker still. Um, do you think you'd ever give up the ciggies? Um, oh, I should think so. Yes? Mm. Yeah. I right. Think. What, what would be the context <laughs> in which you give them up? Well, um, probably the context would be a general giving up of most things yes. that keep you going. Because I, I do remember as a young man when I, when I started smoking, one of the reasons I started smoking was because of you. Because Oh, no, really? Well, yes, because I'd been warned about it, of course. Even in the 1970s and early 80s, we knew they were bad for you. But I reasoned to myself, well, if someone as clever as Tom Stoppard smokes, it can't be that bad. Oh, no, it's the dumb side of me. Right. Yeah. I see. Thank you for that. But, uh, <laughs> Do you take the Tynan view of smoking? What was that? He said words to the effect that um, he couldn't live if he couldn't write, and ah. he couldn't write if he couldn't smoke. Yeah, I say the same thing. I understand it through the, uh, something said by a friend of mine whose mother um, asked him more than once if he would not smoke. And he was a boy who worked very, very hard for very little reward. And he said something which touched me to the heart. He said, Mum, that's my holiday. <laughs> <laughs> I remember yeah. you saying once that you, you couldn't bear to write a play that didn't have any jokes in it. Mm. Um, I wouldn't know how. And there are some very good ones in this play, but it's its general trajectory is not comedic. This no. is a dramatic play. Yes. Do you think in terms of genre at all when you're writing a play? I don't. I don't allow myself. The fabric that I work with seems to me to combine everything that the human heart can, as it were, feel. The idea of making a divide between comedy and drama, comedy and tragedy, doesn't do it for me. In comedy, the characters don't laugh. Mm -hmm. In tragedy, they weep. And I don't write tragedy. It's a funny thing to say when I've written a play in which a huge tragedy occurs. But tragedy as subject matter and tragedy as a methodology a choice of what kind of writer mm. one wishes to be. They're two different things. It's been said many times that the loss and grief are kind of absolute, and you feel it to the nth. You might lose a parent or a child or a country. The thing in itself is unquantifiable. You're um, powerfully aware of what's going on in the society around you. You're one of the last people I know who reads a uh, couple of newspapers every day in print. I've seen you at the kitchen table, there they are. You're also someone who goes to the theatre a lot. You like to see what the new younger writers are up to. I'm always very impressed with that because I'm a bit of a, a, a lazy person, I think. Uh, whereas you seem invigorated constantly by the new and the now. How do you feel about where England and Europe are at right now relative to over the last 50 years? Do you despair? Do you have any optimism? What are your feelings about the way well, things One should are going? never abandon optimism, but it's the condition, isn't it, of, uh, or said to be the condition of getting older in oneself, that one finds the present disappointing and the past a lost domain. Yes not necessarily utopia or paradise, but something better. Whether that's a completely subjective and emotional uh, experience in the head, or whether the, there's some empirical reality to that, 
I'm definitely of that persuasion. I'm a nostalgic kind. Of, I mean, I, mm. I, I actually enjoy nostalgia. Um, I think back to places I've been in the past, and I miss what they were like. And I'm revolted by the modern world in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in certain ways. Now and again, one has this moment of, oh my God, what have we come to? I'm, you know, I'm not on the internet, personally. I, I know. Um, I don't possess a computer, mm -hmm. though I have a, I have a cube computer address, but I don't have a computer. It seems to me that, that that's, that's now a watershed in the human experience as much as any war, for example, mm -hmm. could have been, changes the way people behave. Talking of computers, um, you, you write by hand. You wrote a novel, you've written many, many plays, you've written many screenplays. Have you ever written poetry? Uh, for domestic consumption, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Comedic poetry? I, no. I can imagine you, no, you've no, written no. limericks. For yeah, oh yes, that's verse. Right, but you have written romantic poetry for domestic uh, I've probably consumption. Probably done that three or four times. Yes. No. Do you ever listen to music when you're writing, or is silence your I condition? Have, I have had a, a record, usually a rock and roll record, a track off an album, which I've got a bit obsessed by, and I keep replaying it, mm -hmm. under the impression that I, that it's quite inspiring. Yes. But actually, in the end, I have to turn the thing off because there's nothing quite as inspiring as silence. Right. Was there a particular music that you listened to with this play? No, actually. Though the play is full of music. Uh, well, there is music. And reference in the play. to music. Yes, and... there is. But the last time I wrote a full-length play, it was actually about rock and roll, partly. Mm -hmm. So there was much more connection with, with yes. the music I was listening to. What was the music you loved in your youth? Let's say, I, look, I was 13 in 1950, mm -hmm. so starting there, yeah. it was the kind of housewife's choice pop music. Mm -hmm. uh, Radio Luxembourg, very exotic Americans, Frankie Lane, Johnny Ray. And I was actually at work in my first job when Rock Around the Clock became a record thanks to being in a movie. Mm -hmm. And I've always liked what I call pop music. I would, I would, I would say that the rock and roll is, and blues and everything else are part of, under, under that um, umbrella. Mm -hmm. I've never been properly educated in uh, what people call classical music. I love the way the real thing ends, that, that's where, you, a, where you turn to pop at the end. Yes, it's actually... So I'm a believer, isn't I'm it? I'm a believer, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But it, it seems to me that you've, you use music quite a lot in your work. You're, it, it's I always relevant feel I'm to... getting a free ride. It uh, raises the ante emotionally to have music of any kind actually worked into a play mm -hmm. deliberately. It's usually for emotional reason. But I've always uh, relied on the knowledge of my directors. Always, yeah. Patrick, I hope that... Yes, no, we, well, that. we have some music in the show, yes. yes. When you began the play, did you have any idea of how huge it would be? Because this is one of your... I would say that you, this is a big play, like Coast of Utopia or Arcadia. It's, it's a huge cast. It travels through time. It's... It's a massively ambitious. Well, it's a it's a whole piece. it's a family. It's a sort of extended family. When they're all on stage at the same time, including children, it's probably about I don't know fifteen human beings are sharing yes. the stage. Uh, well, in fact, we have a company of twenty six adult actors, right? That's and fifteen children who are all sharing roles. So it's a. I, I feel terrible about this, but there no, we are. It's, it's, true. It's, it's wonderful to work with for me as a director oh. to have such a big company is a huge challenge, yeah. but it's also very moving to see that many people on a stage. This was a play I, I promised to Sonia Friedman, but I never told her that uh, it would um, require more than 20 actors. I didn't know, really. Yes. So um, the point of starting out on it, you had no idea it would be quite so big. No, I don't think I remember thinking anything like that. But at the same time, I did realize that I was going to have more than one generation and that actors would have to age in the course yeah. of the story. 
And uh, it got quite complicated for me because I, I was never quite sure whether I was changing actors uh, in the process or whether they were just looking older and older. Neither option seemed to be without difficulties. In the end, and this is the great thing about working well, you and, and, and Sonia too, essentially you tend to say, don't think about that, just, just write what you want to write. So uh, I threw caution to the winds.